Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week in Enterprise Tech. I'm Ken Park from Amalgam Insights, joined as always by Charlie Araujo of the DX Institute and the DX Report. All right, so this week, <laughs> Uh, we've seen a lot of AI, 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 but it's really affecting the CIO office from many different angles. So uh, we've noticed uh, everybody from TechCrunch, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, making a lot of noises around AI. And we thought we'd start with a couple of company specific uh, announcements that really caught our attention. And the first one that we want to hit is the Databricks uh, new generative AI model, uh, DBRX, which they are also kind of calling Databricks. I think they're trying to make it catch on. Maybe that'll be their stock symbol when they IPO. But uh, uh, regardless of that, <laughs> uh, what what do you think about that uh, new uh, generative AI model that they put out? Well, well, the first thing you did blew my mind because I did not connect DBRX with Databricks. I don't know why I'm an airhead, I guess. But... Um, <laughs> Three, three big things, three big takeaways that I, I, I mean, I thought it was a, a honestly a shocking announcement. We were just talking about Databricks the other day. I mean, there was almost mm -hmm. no clue that this was really coming, um, in part because the, fir the first big shocking thing about it was how fast and, and really how inexpensively. I, I, I don't have it up right now, but I think it was three months. They, they started this beginning of this year. Yes. I mean, three mm -hmm. months to roll this thing out, $10 million investment. And, and granted, you know, it's a, that's a little bit of a minute misnomer because it, it was really part of their acquisition. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit to that, but, but it's still shocking how fast and then how performant it appears to be, at least compared to the op other open source AI models. And so, you know, it, what it really, I think is, is striking is how quickly the industry is learning and, and what that means to how quickly we're going to see additional development, which then leads to the second one. And that is they've chosen to make this open source. We've been having this sort of ongoing conversation about what's going on in the open source space, how it applies in AI. Um, and I think, and I'm not sure if we've even talked about this one. There was an article recently that I read that talked about how you almost can't even consider open source AI in the same breath as traditional open source because it is so different. Um, there's some stuff uh, that's happening this week, which we'll tease for next week about a potential a catastrophic issue with a big open source platform. So it's like, I think open source is sort of under assault and yet here we have Databricks releasing this as an open source model, but like every other AI open source model we've seen, not in the traditional way we think of open source. It's the sort of restricted license and a big question mark as to what that's going to mean. So I think this is a, another salvo in the AI wars in general, specifically on the open source side. And I think it's, a, it's an important um, entrance into that space that I think is really interesting. And then the third piece that I took away that was really, really sort of eye-opening is that at least my read, and I think they alluded to this, but it's a little bit of reading between the lines, is that they're almost putting this to me as like a proof of concept. So they're really sort of saying, hey, you enterprises, if you want to build your own LLM using proprietary data that, by the way, we Databricks are helping you manage, mm -hmm. we can help you do that. And, and that it's almost like this, putting this thing out there and doing it so fast, so inexpensively is a major shot across the bow to say, you don't have to rely on these big um, open or no, these big, you know, big tech LLMs, mm -hmm. you can build your own proprietary and we can help you do that. And that's going to tie into some of the other conversation we're having today about a lot of the fear around these LLMs. So I think it's a, it was a really interesting announcement that, that frankly, from my perspective, came almost out of nowhere. Yeah, and I like how Databricks is basically making this, like, as you said, a proof of concept. Remind, reminds me a little bit of what uh, like Google does with the Pixel phones to say, here is a reference standard that you can use of the current latest and greatest. And this is what you can, as this is a starting point for figuring out how to build an app on Android and to build new capabilities onto our mobile platform. Um, Databricks has done something similar. And of course, they are in the entire business of helping large Fortune 500 organizations to build their own models. So now they say, here's how we did it for $10 million. Now you can spend $10 million with us to get the same thing or to have a better result than you've been trying to do. You've been trying to do this whole thing piecemeal 
um, and to figure out how to build this uh, LLM from scratch or how to fine tune something but not getting the results you're looking for, or you've been playing with this thing called retrieval augmented generation and you're able to get a little bit of your own data in this model, but you weren't quite able to make it all work. So Databricks is saying, now we have this whole end-to-end -end, uh, process and we can show you exactly what it looks like at the end. And I think that's a key difference because uh, we're starting to see press releases from other startups that are saying, we are also end-to-end -end large language model generation, uh, generative AI platforms that can help you build your own model. Um, Databricks has already proven that they can get all the way to the end point of having this gigantic uh, large language model that will get basically as big as any enterprise normal enterprise will care about. Um, you're always going to have these hyperscalers that care about the, the even bigger models, the 50 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion parameters uh, models. But most companies are going to want to keep it to kind of a few billion parameters, uh, something that they can actually run and uh, actually be able to afford <laughs> the, the bill for at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I know we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about the whole ROI about AI later, mm -hmm. and I think this, this ties into that conversation. But one of the things that I think is interesting is they almost almost buried in there was the this really interesting development from a technology perspective or from an innovation perspective of how they approached it is that they're using this interesting approach that, that sort of abstracts away where they're not having to apply every parameter against every query, right. every, every um, interaction. And that means your token load is lower and it means it's faster. And that was a huge part. So I think we're gonna see that replicated. I think that's a huge innovation um, that, that I think is really gonna open the door. And I think it's also going to sort of rekindle the debate. You know, We've been talking a little bit about this idea of the AI app sitting on top of the LLM layer. And you know, there's another thing and a new term that's being thrown around, a, agentic AI, this idea of the AI agent that is basically this version of, of leveraging both of these. And, you know, I have, until this announcement, I was sort of the mindset that that's where all the innovation in the, in the traditional enterprise was going to take place. And it didn't make sense to be building your own LLM, but this sort of changes that, I think. I mean, I think, um, you know, $10 million, while is a lot of money, if you are a Fortune 200 company, that is completely within the realm of a spend target that you could absolutely invest if you got enough value out of that. So I think, you know, it's, it is really game changing, I think, in many ways, I think it's, it is too early to tell, but um, I think it could be really, really, really fascinating. Right. A few weeks ago, we talked about the city of Birmingham and its challenges with an ERP upgrade, which has gone into the hundreds of millions. Uh, and, you know, although that was a project gone bad, it, it is not, wild to think about an ERP upgrade taking a hundred million dollars and that being budgeted into a fortune 500 IT budget you know compared to that uh 10 million dollars to actually build an AI model that is usable by your entire employee base seems reasonable uh quite frankly and this mixture of experts uh, uh effort that you were talking about I, I think that is going to be much like a retrieval augmented generation rag uh, as another thing that we're going to talk about, I don't think MOE uh, is a very good acronym, but we'll figure that part uh, later. Uh, but this mixture of experts idea, I think, is something that CIOs will have to think about. Uh, are we doing just a standard large language model or are we doing a mixture of experts large language model that is more efficient? Uh, yeah, and and I know we need to move on, but I do I do think you bring up the city of Birmingham, and and that's the part that worries me about this entire conversation. Well, ten million dollars is absolutely within the spend ratio, and certainly companies like Databricks are going to be making the case that we can help you do this, and clearly the the big SIs are going to be out there pushing this as well. It it does speak to the fact that your traditional enterprise often has challenges with these sort of complex endeavors and executing well, or at least can run into them, and that's going to be. The big question mark is, you know, can organizations actually execute on this? Can they do it effectively? Do these $10 million spends turn into $100 million explosions and, and are they be, do they become train wrecks, especially because this now is harvesting all of the data within the system? And, you know, so I think there's there's still so many questions. We're going to be talking about some of that today. So we're, this was a great way to leap off because it hints at all these other sort of news items that also hit that touch on all these different elements of the, the sort of the AI challenge for the CIO. Right. And so uh, 
changing gear just a little bit uh, on the uh, small startup side, an announcement that really got our attention was uh, this new company called Hume AI, uh, started in 2021 by Alan Cohen, former Google guy. Uh, they are working on this thing called um, emotional or uh, like a more, uh, having a more uh, empathic AI, uh, really focusing on uh, emotional inputs and outputs and getting the feelings associated with AI. Right. And I'm curious what they've got your attention. Well, so what's interesting about it is so we've had things like, you know, um, intent recognition for a mm -hmm. long time. Right. However, that intent recognition, generally speaking, has come in the form of what words we are using. What what is interesting, there's two real interesting things about uh, Hume's announcement. The first is it's it's all voice based. Right. So it is it is effectively saying there's this entire layer of subtext in our voice, which, of course, as humans, we all know. Right. When when I say a word to you, how I say it and the inflections I use with my voice is an entire data layer. It's communicating all of this sort of nonverbal elements as far as not the words I'm using. And so it's trying to capture all of that and leverage it to understand the emotional sub layer of a conversation. And so I think that it's it, this isn't a huge step in my mind um, insofar as, you know, we, we've already had this idea of understanding intent. But I think it's a it's a pretty big leap in in being able to harvest this sort of data and doing it at scale. There are other companies that have been doing this in the call center space for a while in different forms. And so which leads to the second thing I think is really interesting is that they are not attempting to provide their own LLM or attempting to provide their own interface directly. They're an API driven solution. So the idea of being embedded into other systems mm -hmm. as a way to add this contextual layer. So. Uh, you know, I think the jury is out as to uh, whether or not in and of itself, this is a game changer. But what I think kind of tying into everything we just talked about, it's another sign of how the market is evolving and how we're going to continue to see greater differentiation and 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 extended use cases that right now we maybe aren't necessarily imagining. So um, I think that, um, in fact, I should have grabbed him to remember you know, we, we all consume so much information. I sometimes lose it, but I was mm -hmm. talking, or maybe it was this article talking about how, you know, there's iRobot, one of my favorite movies, right? The, with the Will Smith, where these robots that are interacting and this idea of having that layer where they're interacting like a human would, mm -hmm. well, this type of software is going to be critical to achieving that at some point. And I think it's going to be really important when we think about anything to do with the customer experience, anything that I'm going to stick a piece of robotic automation in whatever form in front of a customer, I need that, that element. Mm -hmm. So whether or not it's Hume or how that gets played, um, I, I just think it's an interesting sign of how things are developing. Yeah. So I have to admit, I always have my doubts about uh, something that is called emotional or empathic. And looking at the um, approach that Hume AI takes, um, you know, the founder uh, has an advanced degree in computational psychology. So obviously is much smarter than I am, has thought about this problem to a greater extent than I have. But uh, in the approach that he seems to be taking, it seems to be very uh, specific uh, responses, like, uh, like responding to specific words with some sort of emotional um, output. And I wonder if the uh, approach might be too granular because when we have emotional responses, they tend to be systemic, you know, based on uh, both what we've heard and what we see and what we feel and our gut reaction based on a whole set of historical um, circumstances. It, it's not basically saying, uh, you know, bad is bad. As Michael Jackson taught us, sometimes bad is good. <laughs> um, you know, just simple things like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, and and yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not I'm not so sure on Hume specifically. I I'm looking at this directionally, right? If I look at the way OpenAI, at least what they have out publicly, or any of the others, if you hit the little microphone, all they're doing is they're using the voice interface to simply translate your words into text, and then processing that text, right? That's all it's doing today. And so what I think about this is interesting is that is that Hume is attempting to add another layer, right? And I I, I agree. I don't think where, you know, this is, you know, probably not even 1.0 yet, right, in terms of where it's at. 
but directionally, I think it's just interesting because what I where I see this leading us to is two things. One is something that I believe we're going to end up in a, with a long time, and that is a voice first, um, arch, you know, architectural interface, right? That that we are going to move away from everything being text driven and move to everything being voice driven. And secondly, that it's not going to be voice driven simply by converting to text, but that our voice actually becomes that additional data layer. And so that's to me, I look at this as directional more than, hey, Hume is really nailing it. Um, and I think it just, it, it's it's a sign of the evolutionary process of where this technology is going. Yeah, and I, I've looked at some startups in this space in the past, uh, like uh, formerly a company called Conjoya, started by uh, Armin Berjerkley that uh, was, was uh, been acquired. Uh, there's a startup right now called Textio that really focuses on job applications and employee feedback and makes sure that you are not being a jerk when you are talking to your employees or responding I can to use that with a few of my former bosses. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's a great use case. Um, so, but seeing this general use case uh, is going to be an interesting, uh, you know, starting point uh, for, uh, to see how far it can really go. Uh, right now, I feel like sometimes we're trying to paper over everything, everything by saying Gen AI <laughs> and hope that it solves everything. But, uh, you know, the next couple of years are going to actually show what is useful uh, and where the use cases really are, as we're going to be digging into a bit <laughs> later. Absolutely. Well, and I, I do think it's um, you know, that that's probably a good way to segue into sort of this bigger picture, this broader conversation, mm -hmm. um, because there there are a lot of real large macro sort of movements underway that are going to affect all of this. And if you're a CIO trying to, you know, to me, and that's again where I look at Hume, it's like reading the tea leaves. Where is all this going? What does this mean? What should I be focused on? And so I don't know if there's one of those that you wanted to start with, but I think there's there's some really these Big sweep. Well, actually, I am going to start and pick the one because sure. the one that I thought was most interesting, um, not even because it was the article was all that great, but it, it's it's a there's a couple of these that I think are topics that we just aren't talking about enough, and that's specifically about the ROI or the practical use cases um, in terms of how AI is being applied. And so there are two different articles, both in the Wall Street Journal. One was specifically on how organizations are assessing the ROI of AI investments. And the other one is about um, specifically in supply chain, traditional supply chains, how they are used and starting to leverage AI to solve specific practical problems. And and I saw both of these mm -hmm. as very interesting. The first in the article that uh, you pointed out on ROI, I think it talked about 43% of, I forgot it was Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 companies are preparing to invest $100 million in Gen AI. So we talked about that $10 million investment. You know, They're already making bigger plans. And then I look at the supply chain one, and what was really struck me is companies that we aren't really even talking about in the context of AI, companies like Solonis, which is a process mining and task mining company, mm -hmm. right, helping organizations apply specific applications of AI to solve very specific targeted problems, in this case around supply chain. And so I thought it was really interesting because we, we often talk about this big macro stuff, and the real question is, well, how do you, how do you start to bring this down. So I'm curious your take on on sort of both of those perspectives. Yeah. So first, from a very tactical perspective, the return on investment on technology, you know, at the end of the day, that is percentage that is based on an actual amount of money that you are expecting to get back. If you are spending, let's call it $100 million, uh, typically, uh, when you're doing this for a technology that is uh, fairly emerging, you are trying to calculate for uh, a 300% or more return, partially because there's a lot of risk involved. Uh, there's a lot of things that may not end up happening, but you want to at least uh, be able to build out a solid expectation that you could get to call it $300 million in return on an annual basis. And, you know, some of that might fall through and, you know, for all sorts of different reasons, but um, if you can't get there, it starts being hard to say why you should spend that hundred million dollars in the first place. If you can't get to that upside of, you know, call it three, five to ten x uh, return. I think beyond ten x, um, honestly, if you're seeing returns, you know, in the beyond that, you probably have something broken in your company beyond uh, AI. 
Um, uh, an example being, uh, if, if you're flying 10,000 people a year to go training somewhere, when you can turn that into a YouTube video, obviously you're going to get like, you know, a gazillion percent ROI, but that's just because you're doing things in a really bad way. <laughs> uh, but but I, I think that's the challenge that uh, we have to equate AI at the end of the day to uh, saved costs or additional productivity or additional revenue. And one of my concerns is that uh, we're starting to think of AI just as a way to cut labor rather than a way to actually improve uh, services and improve uh, business outcomes. And that's what I liked about the supply chain uh, article is that it talked about a part of your company that you could actually improve by using AI rather than simply trying to uh, perhaps uh, replace contact center agents, which is this mission that technology has been trying to do for decades now with very little success. I, I think all of us have been annoyed uh, more than anything else by technology's attempts to replace agents. <laughs> Yeah, well, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I think, you know, that the, in all likelihood, all it does is shift because at the end of the day, as humans, there are times where we want to talk to another human and that's not going to change or go away. What, what I thought, um, I think, so we're going to talk, I think, next about the sort of emerging battles. And I think there's a handful of these battles that are emerging. And one of them is in, I'll call it the broad versus tactical or maybe that's right right horizontal versus vertical application mm -hmm. and so the supply chain one is a very you know a classic case of this verticalization where people coming in and, and applying it in very targeted use cases and then i look at the other end of the spectrum and the roi article talked about for instance that microsoft copilot is 30 dollars per seat right and and that is like general productivity use now i use Gen AI, I actually have three of different Gen AI agents that are Gen AI tools that I use on a daily basis. So I get the productivity gain, but I think it's going to be a lot harder to justify $30 a month times 10,000 people ROI on general productivity because it's going to be, even if it's real, it's going to be so hard to quantify. How am I being more productive? How am I adding more to the bottom line because I'm saving this few minutes a day using Gen AI for something? Whereas with these vertical applications that are sort of right now ha you know, traveling off radar a little bit, um, I think there's, that's where you're going to see that exponential ROI that's going to be truly transformative. And, and going back to that supply chain article that I thought was really interesting is something that I'm a huge, huge believer in is that when you are doing this right, you will simultaneously improve your efficiency, reduce costs, maybe it may be an employee thing, but more likely it's in just normal waste, mm -hmm. and, and you're gonna deliver a better customer experience all at the same time, right? And so that's where you get that exponential ROI. And so I think it is gonna be this interesting sort of battle play out as we get mm -hmm. past these initial hype cycle stages and people start really figuring out how to apply it. So it, it, they were both fascinating from kind of juxtaposition. And I think there's a lot of room for uh, a lot of these process-based companies like uh, Salonis, uh, ServiceNow, the Automation Anywheres of the world to really, frankly, make bank on this AI trend if they can align things correctly. I feel like a lot of AI companies that are trying to make claims about being the providing business AI are missing a lot of the foundational process mapping and process automation uh, capabilities that uh, other companies have just for, have been in the position to spend a decade to build up. Uh, this honestly is not a great space for new startups to come into just because so many established companies have such a head start uh, in in building all that foundational data and not having to figure out where to get it from. Yeah, no, no, exactly. I think it's, um, I, I think it's going to be just really interesting to see how this plays out. And I, and, you know, I don't, I remember talking to Phil Donahoe um, the, at the time he was the CEO of ServiceNow and mm -hmm. I was talking about the platform wars um, uh, between like ServiceNow and Salesforce and his words was, you know, there's room for all of the platforms. And I think we're going to see sort of the same thing with the AI platforms. 
there's room for all of them in so far as um, I think organization CIOs and, and business leaders are going to become very strategic about where they're applying it in different ways. And I think part of, that's partly why, you know, we can, we're going to have this entire conversation today about AI, but it's not all one conversation. It's, you know, AI is going to become this incredibly diverse. It's already this incredibly diverse nuanced topic that, that attaches and, and affects everything. And so I think, you know, if you're a CIO today, it's, you're starting, you need to start evolving your thought that it's not, you know, it, I bristle when people, but you need AI strategy. No, you don't really you need a business strategy, but you need to be asking yourself how you're infusing AI into every element of that business strategy, because it's probably going to affect it across every, every element of it. Yeah. And also we're seeing these separate types of systems. So the system of record obviously has been around for a very long time. But now we're seeing these systems of interaction, these systems of process uh, process definition uh, really coming into play. Like ServiceNow, yes, it has it is a system of record, but really what it does well is it defines process uh, very well uh, for what you're trying to do. And being able to do that either on a departmentally specific basis, like some of these financial close solutions that uh, walk you through the close to be able to cut that time in half or to be able to uh, do that at, on a service basis or whatever, you know, that, those process mapping capabilities are important. And then we're, and then you have to be able to use that to transform uh, what you're doing digitally, something that I've heard you've done once or twice uh, in your career, Charlie. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I do think what's interesting too is is the, you're, you're dead on. I think that what we're we're seeing is again we go through these cycles, and I think we're seeing the re rise and prominence of process and how that applies because it becomes the anchor for all this automation, which then becomes an anchor for all the application of AI to then help drive and enable that automation. And I think it and and I think the other element of that, and that, again, the reference like this, when I was reading this, I'm a, I've been following Salons for a long time. And it honestly caught me a little off guard. I knew they had elements of AI, but when I read this article, it's like, yeah, because it, this is about very targeted, right? This isn't necessarily about this broad-based application. We're going to, you know, completely transform our supply chain with AI. No, we're going to apply AI in these very specific stages where we can get that benefit. And I think that's interesting. So, you know, I, I think the other thing, if I if I look at the landscape. If I'm a CIO today, I think that one of the great challenges is going to be where are you placing those bets? And, you know, to a certain extent, it's probably going to be a little bit of playing the craps table and placing bets all over the table, right? Not just one bet. But I do think we're seeing a couple of um, a couple of these battles sort of play out. And there was news on both a couple of these fronts uh, that I wanted to kind of get your take on. The first is this consortium that is rising up. Um, to try mm -hmm. to combat NVIDIA's dominance in the market. So obviously we just came out of GTC and they were all the news. And and now there's this consortium that is made up of, to a certain degree, some of the usual suspects, right? The the chip competitors, Intel and, and uh, I think with Qualcomm. Um, but the one that was interesting in this mix of, of members of the consortium was Google. Because, of course, Google is heavily invested with NVIDIA, and so they're sort of trying to play it both ways here, which will be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but I clearly think, I was reading this other analysis um, talking about you know, one of Jeff Bezos' famous, famous quotes that your profit is my opportunity, and clearly mm -hmm. NVIDIA has a ton of profit sitting on the table, and so there's a whole lot of people saying, how can we come and take some of this? And I think in the end, that's going to be good. Um, you know, the question mark to me is, does that matter if you're an, if you're a CIO today? Does any of that really matter? Is this like kind of happening up in the stratosphere and in the end it's it's going to just trickle down and not really affect? Um, so that's my question of your take on on the importance of this, because I've, I've definitely read some people go, hey, this is a big deal. And others that are looking at it going, eh, you know, probably won't have much of an impact. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges right now in AI is that. NVIDIA has such a stranglehold on uh, GPUs, uh, which are the fundamental uh, starting point for being able to experiment with AI. Uh, obviously, Google has its TPUs, uh, which are a competitor. And it's interesting to see how Google is 
increasingly seeing an opportunity to sell this because there's just such a gap in the market between uh, what people want to be able to experiment with on an AI perspective and the compute that is there, especially since big tech is sucking up so much of the supply that currently exists for AI chips. So you see Google doing that. And then you see uh, another announcement I saw around uh, Microsoft and OpenAI at least uh, giving, talking about doing a hundred billion dollar commitment to its own AI data center saying, we're gonna throw all this CapEx in and hopefully create the next AI cloud. So all the big uh, tech companies are pushing against each other really hard because right now when everybody says AI, the response is always NVIDIA. And then with NVIDIA saying, we want to get into software and, and creating a software development platform, basically to do an end run around all of your, your platform plays, um, they're all realizing, oh, we, if we don't do something, NVIDIA really will eat our lunch with all this money that they have and this market cap that allows them to basically acquire whatever they don't have and keep, keep growing. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a wild time right now because I feel like it, it is very hard as a CIO to figure out who is actually doing what. Um, of course, we know Microsoft and Google are software companies uh, and they've done great jobs uh, selling that. And now it looks like they want to be hardware companies as well. And, and you know everybody wants to be everything to everyone right now. And it's hard to tell what exactly is going to catch on. This is, this is definitely a year to honestly spend a bit on R and D and, and place a bunch of bets on the table. Cause it's real. Cause otherwise you are going to be left behind. I mean, I think as a CIO today, I'm looking at this and saying, I'm not sure how much this, this, uh, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I'm sitting here sort of stuck, right? Because I go on the one hand, I feel like it's, it's so far up in the stratosphere that it may not matter to me in the end, mm -hmm. at least unless I'm, you know, general motors or something. Um, but on the other hand, I look at this and say, you have to make some very pragmatic decisions, right? So the other big battle that's sort of developing is this battle that's occurring between Microsoft and OpenAI on one side. We just talked about this massive investment. They're talking about building this new supercomputer kind of approach, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have Amazon, and they've just finished their $4 billion investment with Anthropic. And the, you know, the latest version of Claude is supposedly, at least according to benchmarks, outperforming um, current the current version of, of ChatGPT for Turbo, right? So it's like you're 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 looking at all this and going, okay. So to me, this is like the more pragmatic decision. But meaning, if I'm a CIO, do I bet on the Microsoft OpenAI side? Do I bet on the Amazon um, Anthropic side? Um, and if I'm if I'm a CIO, today, I'm probably placing bets on both. I'm probably not putting all my eggs in one basket. Um, but going all the way back to the NVIDIA conversation, you know, you said they're software companies. Yeah, but in the world of AI, you can't be a software company without at least deeply engaging on the hardware sides, which is why Amazon's making chips. Microsoft is now in this process with OpenAI going down that road is get, you know, trying to explore how they play more on the hardware side. I mean, it's, it is becoming so, so complex that, you know, to try to make sense of it. I think you, you bet on both, I, you know, because I look at this. Um, OpenAI to me, because they're so young, is is the big variable. But I'm not inclined to vote again to 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 bet against either Microsoft or AWS at this point. And so, you know, you sort of place bets with both. And then, of course, you know, where where does Google land? And then Google's been fighting to kind of remain relevant in the cloud wars to begin with. And is this their big chance to leapfrog? So, I mean, it's it's a really really interesting place and time. And I think the hard part is, is it's sort of like if you're the, your average CIO, right, that, you know, isn't a CIO of a, of a $200 billion company, you're sitting and you're sort of watching these giants duke it out. And you're trying to figure out, you know, which one you're attaching to and just trying not to get hit by the debris falling from the, from the sky. And it's, um, it's a, it's this challenging point, but I also think it represents a lot of opportunity if you sort of guess right, or if you place those bets strategically. Yeah, and I think at this point, uh, as a CIO, I, I would be thinking about how do I create uh, a model uh, that best reflects the business needs of my company? Uh, how do I tune it with the data that I need? How do I maintain control of the model? Uh, as well as how can I take advantage of the constant advancements that will continue to happen with LLMs over the next couple of years? Because it is... 
I would expect that GPT-5 will be uh, significantly better than GPT-4. Uh, Claude will continue to get better and better, and they're going to throw literally billions of dollars at this problem. I want to be able to leverage that, but I don't want to be completely beholden to any one company at the same time. So when we talked about Databricks before, great. Right. If I can do my, uh, or if I, if I can build my own custom model that I own and be able to perhaps augment it as needed with the latest and greatest uh, you know, that would be kind of a best case scenario because then I don't. And have that's to exactly worry. where I think this lands. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's exactly where I think this is. It's not one, the other, it's all, mm -hmm. and it's about being, and, you know, but the challenge, of course, if you're a CIO who isn't spending all their time, I mean, you and I are having trouble keeping track of all this, and this is what we do. <laughs> if you're a CIO, this isn't what your actual job is, you know, trying to make sense of this is really, really challenging. And so that's, I think, going to be the, the difficult part, which leads to the other conversation that, uh, or the other set of articles you brought up, and I, um, uh, both related to um, government actions. Um, mm -hmm. One is, and I'll I'll let you preface this actually because you have a better handle on it. But um, why don't you kind of set the stage? Because I have some, I, I think there's some real instructive elements here to what the these a couple of the news items out of the government that came out. Yeah, one, one of the things that really got my attention last week was about how the White House was announcing uh, an actual defined policy that requires every single department to have uh, defined AI safeguards, as well as an AI, call it czar or boss, uh, by the end of the year, basically. Um, they are all very focused on trying to figure out how to make the executive branch of the government uh, understand what is going on from an AI perspective because things are changing so quickly. Um, and I think that actually is a great, um, a great uh, call to action for basically every company. Um, no matter how small you are, we are all dealing with this new age of AI, which at the very least creates security issues that we have not fully thought out. And uh, frankly, the smaller the company, probably the more risk you are because uh, the fewer governance issues you have and the easier it is for some dumb owner to click on something and, <laughs> and mess things up for their entire company. <laughs> So I looked at that announcement and I saw two things. The first is I completely agree with you. I think it is it is right minded of identifying within every agency a head of AI to look at this. And I think I, I every every CIO at least every organization should be going down that same road. Having someone to, to the point we just made, this is so hard to keep track of. There's it's moving so fast that every organization needs someone whose job is dedicated to paying attention to this and figuring out how to apply it. The part that I took umbrage with a little bit is that I actually read through that announcement from the White House twice mm -hmm. looking for it's like wait there's got to be the other side of the coin because it's almost exclusively focused on risk mitigation mm -hmm. it's exclusively focused on you know making sure and, and look at it's the government I get it that's part of their big concern is is safeguarding and I think from a regulatory putting we've talked about this right some of the because this is in response to that broader um, policy statement that the, the executive policy that Biden put out um, talking about all of this from a from an overall perspective, industry-wide and whatever. And I think that's all very important. But if I'm looking at it from the government perspective and certainly from a company perspective emulating this, you need to be looking at both sides, not just risk mitigation, but the innovation side. How am I leveraging this mm -hmm. and where are the opportunities to create advantage from it, right? How do I apply this? It is is investing in Microsoft Copilot the the thing that's going to get me the best bang for my buck, or is it some other approaches? And I think that having someone who's dedicated to looking at all of this is critical. But you need to be looking not just at the. I mean, honestly, I was I read the thing from um, from the OMB, and it was it was like just all fear driven. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I get it. We need to be cautious, but we also need to be taking advantage of this immense opportunity of what we can do with this. And that was the part that I looked at and said, ah, oh, you know, that, that was what's missing. And if I'm a CIO, emulate part, but expand it. You know, you got to look at the whole picture. 
right? I kind of think of what uh, the Air Force did uh, with their Kessel Run effort, basically saying, we need a software foundry within our department to fully take advantage of open source and being able to move faster and acknowledge that all of our technology is software based at this point. Like, yes, we've got the cool fighter jets and all of that stuff, but we need software at the end of the day to be able to uh, defend the country better and to make everything run better. And so they made that effort to actually build a software foundry because they knew that they had to take that next step. And AI is very similar in that we are going to need uh, AI czars who not only understand the risks, but also the opportunities. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, that, you know, but in that uh, line of thought, uh, we also saw that, um, you know, not only did the executive branch uh, look at AI as a risk, but we saw that the U.S. House all banned the use of Microsoft Copilot uh, within their uh, organization. And uh, when I'm talking about the House, I'm not necessarily talking about the representatives who, um, you know, whatever, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and, uh, uh, you know, AOC are going to do whatever they're going to do. But the House has its own office of people that actually run things. <laughs> uh, and inside that actual uh, organization, uh, they've decided to not use Microsoft Copilot because they uh, don't understand, they, they feel they don't understand the risk uh, fully and don't want to open up government business to the outside world. And it, it's interesting that Microsoft has actually uh, acknowledged that this is still an issue and they know this and they are working on government grade Copilot as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that one, you know, I think um, I, I had less issue with that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that there is, we are still so early. And and what it really speaks to more than anything is that the actual value and benefit of using Copilot or any of the Gen AI tools is still so speculative that it's it's hard to justify the unknown risk, right? I mean, that's always the, the issue. And, you, you know, this is a government office. And they're looking at this and the big their big risk is the the PR blow up of some kind of a breach because they just didn't know. And and, you know, we, we something we haven't talked about a lot, um, but what's getting lost in the conversation a little bit is with, with the speed of development of LLMs and Gen AI in general, is that it's still a black box. I mean, the, the, the you know, there was prior to. Um, chat GPT sort of taking the world by storm, there was a massive amount of focus on on creating, you know, moving from black box to white box um, approaches to to really creating visible AI. And it's almost all been lost because we we literally have no way of understanding how an LLM is actually working. Mm -hmm. And there's been so much perceived value out of what Gen AI can deliver that that part of the conversation has almost been just completely skipped or, you know, put in the drawer. And, and it's going to be a barrier for certain applications like in government. So, I mean, I'm not actually familiar with what Microsoft's approach on their government edition. I saw in that, in that news article that they had made reference to a government edition that was forthcoming, but I'm assuming it's just going to be sandboxed in some way. But the reality is I don't know how you, how you really do that in the grand scheme of things. So it's, there's definitely going to be some challenges with that. Um, but I will say, I think that if I'm an organization, so leaving the government aside, because there's organizations that are taking the same policy. And I think unless unless you are a defense contractor or, you know, I mean, I think there's probably situations, but in most cases right now, I think experimentation, the value of experimentation outweighs the risk because, you know, you may be really secure and safe, but if you get left behind in this, with it moving as fast as it is that I think that that is going to be more dangerous to your survival. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a definitely, again, why, why you knew that AIs are to help you weigh out that decision and it's not an all or nothing. It's picking your battles, picking your places and making your bets. I do feel like there's a little bit of a market for kind of what I'd call vanity IT though. Like if you get that government grade air gap solution that is fully private and locked down like Fort Knox, then uh, I feel like there will be at least some sort of niche market for that kind of uh, AI as well <laughs> once uh, Microsoft puts it. Well, that and it, it goes all the, way, all the way back to Databricks. That's where I think Databricks provides some opportunity, not, not only in the fact that they did it so fast and so inexpensively, but because of that approach, it's also a much smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. um, at least in theory, they're talking about being able to build this model on the expensive 
infrastructure and then effectively you know, migrating it so that my inference platform doesn't need to be nearly as extensive, which means it's now within the realm of possibility of running this locally or running within a, a captive closed environment. So I think, you know, I, I, there's, there, there's so much going on. There's so much to try to, to suss out, but, but I do think again, going all the way back to where we started, why I think that has such an impact because it, it has the potential to, um, alleviate some of those concerns because I agree with you. I think there's a market not just in government. There's a lot of companies that are definitely very wary of it. And and this is where I don't take, like I said, where I don't really have an issue with them banning copilot because to me the relative value of being able to to give an employee access to a Gen AI tool to what they could just do a Google search for um, is probably not worth the risk of them exposing data if I don't understand what's going on, right? But it's that's not the same conversation if I'm using it in the context like these supply chain things. And that's why I think you can't just paint this with a big giant brushstroke. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where this lands. Yes, most of the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis are do not uh, rise up to being a trade secret. <laughs> right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And, you know, obviously government's a little bit different, but not that different, you know? And that's where we need to just start being able to differentiate between the different use cases. Yeah. Do we cover it all? Is that everything? Gosh, I, I think we've covered, at, at least at, at a very surface level, <laughs> we, we got to uh, the biggest issues that we were thinking about uh, this week. Obviously, there's so much more to think about from an ROI perspective, a security perspective, a deployment perspective, a strategy perspective. And I feel like part of what really stood out this week was just how encompassing AI strategy actually is from an IT perspective this year, even though it uh, should honestly be a small part of your budget overall, it probably is going to take up a lot of your uh, mind uh, just cycles uh, this year uh, from a strategic perspective, from an architectural perspective, uh, from a talent perspective. So to kind of hammer home your point, there was one other article that we didn't talk about, and we don't need to go into it, but this, you know, if I, if I really boil everything we've talked about today down, it's that if I'm a CIO today, it's how do you apply real critical thought to looking at this landscape and trying to make sense of it? And probably the big thing is to recognize that there's not just one way to skin the cat. The, the article we didn't talk about was about Adobe and their use of what they're calling non-exploitive AI, which which really just means they trained their image model uh, based on licensed content um, and how they're that's helping what they believe is they're helping them win in the market. That part of is, you know, aside whether or not you think that that's the, the winning play or not, the big point is, is that it's easy amidst these really big macro conversations to think that this is all just happening. And as a CIO, you're just sort of riding the wave and you have no control over it. But I think the reality is that there are many, many ways to play this out the Databricks conversation, you know, there's lots of choices to be made here and, and applying critical thought and figuring out exactly where you can apply AI um, gives you, I think, a, a lot more control and power than maybe you realize. Excellent. Thank you for fighting through your uh, late winter storm and power outages to get that last point across. And with that, uh, thanks so much for listening to us. Uh, as always, uh, like, subscribe, comment, and let us know what you want us to take on next week. Uh, thanks a lot and take care. <laughs>